Okay, thanks for the intro. Um, I'd like to emphasize that this work was done alongside many collaborators, Robert Chow, Walter Lasecki, Jason Wheezy, Jeff Bigham, and my advisor, Chris Harrison. So sensors are starting to appear in a range of environments, including the home. There are tons of conventional physical sensors around. But traditionally, the way you use these sensors is to attach them in places like windows and doors as a way to infer what's going on. However, existing physical systems can be fairly ex uh, expensive. Uh, they're often inflex uh, in inflexible and often require running wires around. But the problem with these physical sensors is that the output is really basic. All you know is that the door is open or closed. Unless your question is exactly what the sensor captures, there's no way to ask more sophisticated questions. Uh, we're starting to see smarter appliances uh, that can infer high-level things off of these basic sensors, for example. But even still, these are still fairly special purpose. For example, the Nest is a smart appliance, but still only controls the temperature in your house. And we're also seeing this emergence of video sensing in the house, like drop cams, for example. But all these provide a video stream that doesn't really give you actionable sensor data beyond just movement or occupancy, which is, again, pretty basic. So you can imagine that there's a lot of work in trying to make sense of video data. I'm not sure if it's very clear here. Um, but this is basically done uh, through the entire field of computer vision, making sense of video data. Um, these are really sophisticated and powerful. But because they're special purpose, they're often brittle and inflexible. For example, we can create very sophisticated people counting sensors using computer vision, but that is all that it can do. It cannot easily, I can't easily repurpose that same system to answer another question. So they're also time consuming and, um, and hard, difficult and require a lot of time to develop or train. And so we were curious, how, does this, how much does this actually cost? So we ran a study where we asked programmers how much it would take to make a computer vision system, something very basic, like a bus sensor, as seen here. <laughs> and to make it easy for them, we even gave them training data. And what we found is that the average cost was roughly $3,000 and would take more than a month to build. And that's, again, only this one question that we asked. What was, was there a bus at this stop? So that's the sensor that this you know, computer vision system can answer. So clearly, at $3,000, computer vision powered smart environments are going to be very costly. Um, and they're not likely to be deployed at the home you know, for some time, unless there's some dramatic advance in, let's say, deep learning, for example. This brings us to sensors. And to illustrate what we mean, we're going to go through a live demo, assuming the Wi Fi cooperates. I'm going to skip here, go through this video. <laughs> So here I'm going to launch the Zensers app, and I'm going to sign in, and I'm going to ask a question, like a sensing question. So what I'm seeing here is a live stream from the camera. As you can see, uh, it's live. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight a region of the image, uh, let's say right about there, and then I, you know, it asks me to specify the type of question. So let's say this is a yes-no binary question. I hit next, and then I'm going to enter the question. Are, are, oh, okay. Are hands raised? Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Okay, are hands raised? Pretty good. All right, and then I'm going to set the frequency, let's say five seconds. So now it's set to five seconds. Done, my sensor is live. So now, let me ask the crowd to raise their hands, basically. Can you guys raise your hands? And so here you're, you're seeing live sensor data uh, of your hands being raised, basically. You can see like the, the graph going up. Can you guys put your hands down? OK. See you. OK, there you go. The, hand, uh, the data basically going down. OK, let's raise the complexity a little bit. So let's create another sensor. Um, I'm going to highlight the same region, roughly. Over there. Oh. Clear. I'm going to highlight it. Click next. Now, this time, let's make it a count sensor. 
So count. There's also other options like scale and multiple choice. So I hit next, and then I ask, how many hands raised? Okay, done. Let's set the frequency to five seconds, and hit done. There, the sensor is live. So now we have our hands raised, and how many hands raised? So let me ask you a question. Uh, how many here are from Europe? Can you raise your hands? Okay. How about, can you see the sensor data up there? How about uh, people from Asia? Can you raise your hands? Okay. Let's put higher number. Okay. How about people from North America? Okay. A high number. Okay, and then you can see the sensor graph go at the top. Okay, so that's the live demo of sensors. So what you saw was a live demo of our system. But there I asked two questions. Uh, but you can imagine asking many arbitrary questions about this room. Like for example, are the rear doors open? How many people are falling asleep? How many people are using their laptops? Etc. And in general, I can ask questions about many other contexts and environments, including cities, for example, like how many cars are in this parking lot? Or how busy is this intersection? This, you could also scale this up to businesses, for example. For instance, how many glasses need a refill? Or is there a check on the table? You can also scale this to uh, institutions or schools, like how many students are in attendance, how many students are falling asleep, how many are using their laptops, how many hands are raised. Or in industrial settings, are there two people here, as, such as a buddy system, what equipment is being used, and all other settings, on and on and on. So how does this work? Behind the scenes, we start with crowdsourcing. It turns out that humans are really good at processing images. So here you can see them labeling one of the sensors that we created. Uh, previous work in crowdsourcing has shown that end-to-end -end latency can be roughly around two seconds. Okay, that's cool, but it's going to be ridiculously expensive. Let's look at the cost. To achieve US minimum wage, we pay crowd workers two cents per image. If we have a sensor running every five minutes, that would cost about $6 a day. And if you remember from an uh, earlier study, a CV sensor, a computer vision sensor, costs about $3,000, which means that we can run a human-powered sensor for roughly a year and a half at the same cost. Okay, so you can imagine lots of images are going to be redundant. Right? So for example, this is a parking lot at night. I'm not sure if you can see, but there's like dark images um, in series. Uh, and in our study, we found that 60% of the data is redundant and don't need to be relabeled. And so by detecting similar images, we limit the amount of requests that go to the crowd. So let's reduce our cost, uh, this lets us reduce our cost for quite a bit, down to about $2.30 a day. So now from $3,000, we can actually run our sensor for three and a half years, running purely on the crowd, which is starting to get economically feasible. But what we can actually get the cost down dramatically and that's because all this crowd power is just really giving us high quality labels to bootstrap automatic machine learning classifiers, which are based on a large number of computer vision derived features like luminance and gradients and so on. So the real trick with Zensor is that we go to machine learning as soon as we can, which reduces our cost to essentially about zero. So these are some examples of the sensors that we actually deploy. So here you can see we're counting dishes on the sink, detecting free food in the kitchen for graduate students, and all of the details are in the paper. But the important thing here is that the sensor in our study took about one week's worth of data before we could hand off to machine learning. So that means our average sensor costs about $15 to train. Our best sensor was automated after spending just roughly about $5.40. But our worst sensor required about $41 of training data, which is still pretty good, uh, a lot less than $3,000. So again, let's look at the economics here. So it costs about $2.50 per day for human power, but we only need to do that for a limited time. And our study suggests that this interval is about a week. Okay? But obviously, that depends on a particular sensor, because some sensors are uh, more tougher than the others. Given these parameters, we can bring down the cost to roughly about 
$15 for a fully automated solution. Okay, so let's take a step back and look at the entire process, okay? So, first, crowd workers give us human intelligent accuracy right from the beginning. And in the background, the crowd data is going to train an automatic machine learning algorithm, so you can see it's trying to catch up. Okay, once you get to that point where machine learning is about 95% of the crowd, we hand off the process to automatic classification. So when it catches up, boom, you, uh, you switch. So now machine learning is running, great, and it's very low cost. But how do you know if machine learning is actually working or is continuing to work? Right? You, you, it's, it's hard to tell. So what we have to do is periodically validate against crowd answers. So in this periodic testing, depending on the frequency of your sensor, can cost roughly about $1 to $5 per month. And this turns out to be really important for detecting unforeseen events or error states. For example, um, let's say there's some unknown event like the first snowfall. Okay, so machine learning accuracy will drop because it has never seen training data with snow. And we can detect when this happens because we validate against the crowd periodically. So what we do is immediately when we sense that, revert back to the crowd, which does two things. One, it maintains high accuracy on the system because you revert automatically. And then two, we automatically start gathering new training data. And so over time, we hope to expect machine learning to recover and then the handoff can occur again. So this happens continuously for the left of the sensor, so it's fully adaptive. But most importantly, throughout this entire process, the user only ever sees high accuracy as seen in this yellow line. And all of this happens entirely unknown to the user setting up the sensor. All they see is high accuracy throughout, which is important for end user applications. So what comes out of the system are strongly typed sensors. Uh, for example, a yes-no sensor produces binary output, while a counting sensor produces continuous numerical values. This simplifies our machine learning pipeline, but also allows the developers to build end-user applications, which we expose as an API. So, for example, we built our own end-user programming interface using our API, which lets us create our own triggers. So, for example, when free food in the kitchen equals true, then email grad students. <laughs> So how accurate can this approach be? In our study, we, we expert labeled seven of the 16 sensors we deployed. These expert labels uh, gave us ground truth. We found that six of these seven sensors achieved to within at least 90% of the crowd accuracy, but the mean was 98%. But it's important to note that one of those seven totally failed. And this is really an important point, because some sensors are just not going to work. We sus at first, we suspected uh, that this was the case because we, th we thought that computer vision features that we were using were not sophisticated enough. But when we looked at the data, actually it turned out that the crowd labels were very poor, which in turn meant that the classifier is going to be poor. And we also found another trend, that subjective questions tended to be yield uh, very poor accuracy. For example, one of our questions was, how orderly is the line? So we have a, a sensor that can uh, try to ask the how it is aligned. And this turned out to be very context specific and thus very hard for crowd workers to give quality answers. But for other sensors such as how many people are in the line, it turns out to be fairly accurate because it's more objective that way. And for some questions, you just basically have to run the crowd forever and the machine learning will never converge because this question is too tough. It's not perfect for everything but very useful in particular ad hoc sensing contexts like the home or other environments. So we have little time to go through the other parts in detail, but we looked at image obfuscation as a way to protect privacy. And the biggest implication is that the more you de degrade uh, the image, the crowd becomes less reliable and thus much harder for machine learning to hand out. I think that's all that I have time for, so just please refer to our paper for more details, and thank you all for your attention. I now open the floor for questions.